Flowering plants delight our senses. We love them in our gardens, yet it is little appreciated that they are also the basis of our food. In fact, humans would not have evolved without them. But for the plant, flowers are an enormous drain on limited resources. So why even have flowers? <laughs> Hello, High Society fans. Welcome to an all-new season of High Society. Uh, my name is, of course, David Malmo Levine. And uh, in uh, upcoming shows, we'll talk about uh, the, the court case that's going on now with the Herb School and what happened with that thing. And... Uh, there will also be exciting shows on hemp ethanol and the uh, fascistic encroachment into our very beings by these ne'er-do-well uh, rulers that we are suffering from. But today's show, we're going to be talking about uh, the evolution of human beings and uh, the evolution of cannabis from the earliest flowering plants uh, to the beautiful plant we know today. Um, and what you just saw, that last clip, was a clip from the Nova special, First Flower, which is all about uh, the, these uh, uh, flower lovers and their uh, search for when the very first flower uh, existed in, on planet Earth. Uh, they've only been around for only 120 million years, but uh, uh, mammals have been around for 195 million years, and primates have been around for about 60 million years. So sometime between when uh, mammals existed and when primates existed arose these flowering plants. And cannabis, uh, I'm guessing, is one of the earliest flowering plants because it was wind pollinated. We'll see if we can get some uh, insight into that too. But uh, our next clip, we're going to zoom into a discussion, uh, a PowerPoint presentation uh, given by Dr. Bob Malamid. Um, and I'm uh, going to throw a few pictures on top of it to make it a little more exciting. So uh, enjoy. So endocannabinoids have played an increasing role in man's evolutionary history. Where are we going? How is it possible that cannabis is classified as having no medical value? I mean, this is lunacy. You know, you got a million people in a democracy saying, hey, this makes me feel better, it helps me. You got science that agrees with them. You got 5,000 years of history, and yet it's illegal? What's wrong with this situation here? What is the influence of cannabinoids on the behavior of populations? So, this was an experiment done by Lichtman a while back with the water maze. You, knock, you take the knockout mice, so they don't have their CB1 receptor. You put them in a, way, a maze that's in water. Mice don't like water. They freak out, they swim around, they find the platform. You can do this with the normal mice, or you can do it with the wild type mice. The same thing. They freak out, they find the platform, they learn where the platform is. You take them out, you put them in, they go to the platform. Now you change the position of the platform. You put the mice in. They freak out, they swim around, they go to where it used to be, it's not there. They freak out, they find a new place. The normal mice, if you take them out, will go to the new place. The mice lacking cannabinoid receptors only go to the old place. They cannot relearn. They're stuck in their way of thinking. Can we extend that to humans? I would say yes. So, I call them blips, backwards looking people, as opposed to flips, forward looking people. And Essentially, it's that that's responsible for what I call the biology of democracy. 
the balance of blips and flips. Now, in a population, there are, will intrinsically be those who have above average endocannabinoid levels, and particularly with respect to open-mindedness, because that's what we're really looking at here, the ability to relearn, to take in new information and adjust, you know? Marijuana has medical value. Let's get on with it already, you know? So, in a population, there will intrinsically be those who have above average and those who have below average. And, you know, you can make some guesses as to what might be the case here. I, in fact, think that our president is, is the equivalent of a knockout mouse. Flowering plants were the first advertisers in the world. They put out beautiful petals, colorful patterns, they put out fragrances. And they gave a reward, such as nectar or pollen, for any insect that would come and visit them. And what were they advertising? They were advertising the sexual organs, the female parts and the male parts that were hidden or positioned within the center of this flower. So if they could attract these mobile pollinators to come and mess around, crawl around, feed in this flower, pick up pollen on the legs, pick up pollen on the body, and then fly to another flower some distance away and repeat this process. They could effectively carry their male genetic material in the pollen grain to another flower. It's so tempting to believe that this palette of color and form and texture is, is actually here for the benefit of our own eyes but uh, in truth what we're looking at is simply an unfolding of the story of the survival of their own species the story of flower evolution is integrally linked with that of its pollinators like insects and birds this coevolution has been largely responsible for their remarkable diversity it is believed that there are as many as 400,000 different species of flowering plants, including things as different as roses, wheat, and even apple trees. Oh my God. I can't believe it. I have been wanting to see this. This is Mandragora, made famous in Harry Potter. And here it's already setting fruit. Absolutely fantastic. All flowering plants flower. All flowering plants that flower fruit. The fruit is the new generation. Whether it's an apple, whether it's a pumpkin, whether it's this poisonous berry, it's the point of flowering. It is the renewal of the species, the enhancement of the species as well. This seed possesses that little bit of difference that may allow it to adapt down the road to a different set of circumstances that it might encounter. Welcome back to our show here. Let me tell you what you've just been watching. Uh, the first slideshow was a little thing I whipped up to go over top of a uh, talk by Dr. Robert Melamede called Cannabinoids from Cells to Society and uh, we have a link for it right around here and on the show page at Pot TV. and um, yeah I, I uh, just wanted to add that I don't really believe in animal testing I think it re reveals much more about the cruelty of human beings and their inability to want to uh, look at humans while high and instead want to uh, pretend that it's more scientific to uh, study um, knockout mice uh, it, it does reveal some interesting things about cannabinoid receptors and 
and how knock knock out mice drown if they don't have them. But uh, I think we can learn more about how cannabis affects learning and memory by studying stoned humans in their natural setting. So I'd just like to add that. Uh, also, uh, you saw a um, a clip from this film, First Flower. Um, it's a Nova special uh, on public television, and and uh, it really goes deeply into uh, this search for the very first flower in the world, and how archaeologists have been studying fossils, and they come to the conclusion that it, uh, flowers first arose uh, from mutations uh, about 120 million years ago, and uh, that got me wondering, okay, well, when did cannabis first arrive. Apparently there are no cannabis fossils on record. Uh, I stumbled across this book here, fancy expensive book called The Medicinal Uses of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. Uh, in chapter 4 in an article called The Evolution of Cannabis in Coevolution with the Cannabinoid Receptor, a Hypothesis by John M. McPartland and Jeffrey W. Guy of GW Pharmaceuticals. Um, these guys uh, estimate by uh, examining cannabis's parasites uh, how it has similar parasites to a sister group, the nettle, and uh, no shared parasites with a cousin group, the fig slash mulberry group. So uh, it estimates uh, on that basis that uh, cannabis could have uh, not originated on planet Earth earlier than 34 million years ago. And I thought, okay, that's a while back. That puts uh, cannabis kind of in the into the realm uh, of after primates, uh, but before apes. And that's very interesting. And then uh, these uh, fellows, uh, Dr. Guy and, and uh, McParland, they also uh, point out that endocannabinoids, which uh, you know are found within us and and many many animals, uh, most animals in fact, uh, they go back far far uh, before primates or mammals or even dinosaurs and amphibians and fish. They go back over 600 million years ago to a time uh, even before animals and plants were separate. Um, fascinating stuff. So uh, uh, there's several theories floating around about how how cannabis came into being. To oversimplify it a little bit, uh, it's like a, a mutant nettle plant uh, just kind of started to remember or or you know harken back to a time or draw upon their genetic heritage, which once had endocannabinoids and brought them back and uh, for you know some bizarre mutation, genetic mutation, and this was very attractive to humans or Neanderthals or monkeys. We don't really know how far back our relationship with cannabis goes. It, it could have gone back to uh, well, you know, there's evidence that it goes back uh, tens of thousands when we first started using rope. Um, but uh, it probably goes back farther than that. Uh, 1.8 million to 1 million years ago, we learned to use fire, and it was, you know, uh, around that time we were moving into China, which is uh, kind of Central Asia, which is where cannabis originates, and uh, we could have definitely come in contact with it then. Uh, there's this other book called Intoxication by a guy named uh, Ronald K. Siegel and uh, he points out that lots of animals get high and, and that monkeys uh, have been uh, observed eating hemp leaves so uh, our relationship with cannabis could go back quite far um, there's another really good book on the subject it's called The uh, Botany of Desire by a, a Michael Pollan and um, you should check this book out too if you're interested in this subject there's a real good quote from it I'm just going to read to you uh, whatever 
THC's original purpose may have been, as soon as a certain primate with a gift for experiment in horticulture stumbled upon its psychoactive properties, the plant's, the plant's evolution embarked on a new trajectory, guided from then on by that primate and his desires. And, uh, yeah, all this uh, detail will be found in an article that I'm going to try to get published in Cannabis Culture Magazine, so watch for that. Basically, to sum it up, uh, human beings and cannabis uh, have evolved together, they've strengthened each other, and uh, we are going to need cannabis in the future if we want to continue to evolve, if we want to evolve past uh, poverty, past sickness, past illness. We're going to need our, our first, uh, one of our first medicines, definitely, and, and our first rope, our first true paper. And, and the medicine that brought us the time slow high that, uh, you know, definitely contributed to jazz music and the development of the computer and a lot of other cultural um, benefits like theater and, and uh, writing and, and even religion. So we definitely need cannabis in our lives. We, we need to learn how to share this plant so we can evolve past the point of poverty and we need to learn to stop scapegoating each other and to bring this plant back into our, our lives and our culture fully uh, might give us the opportunity to evolve beyond being a homo sapien beat each other up as soon to go right to homo sapien learn to share this stuff as, if you get my meaning. So uh, we need cannabis to evolve and uh, we should all learn more about it and defend this plant, this wonderful tree of life, and bring it back into our evolution, lest, lest we um, allow the drug war to uh, select all the sensitive, intelligent, autonomous people out of the human race to languish in prison and just evolve to being an obedient, stupid group of people without cannabis. I, I don't want that. You don't want that. Uh, I will leave you with those thoughts. And this, a section of this poem from a guy named Nizami, who lived uh, around uh, between 1141 and 1209 in Azerbaijan, which is right above Iran on the Caspian Sea, in a, uh, a town called Ganja, by the way. Interesting little aside there. But anyway, this, this wonderful poet, Nizami, uh, wrote um, this poem, which I will leave you with. Our fathers planted gardens long ago, whose fruits we reap with joy today. Their labor constitutes a... Welcome back to our show here. Let me tell you what you've just been watching. Uh, the first slideshow was a little thing I whipped up to go over top of a uh, talk by Dr. Robert Melamede called Cannabinoids from Cells to Society and uh, we have a link for it right around here and on the show page at POT TV and um, yeah I, I uh, just wanted to add that I don't really believe in animal testing I think it re reveals much more about the cruelty of human beings and their inability to want to uh, look at humans while high and instead want to uh, pretend that it's more scientific to uh, study um, knockout mice. Uh, it, it does reveal some interesting